Tonight, uh, Randy Ustra, um, former CEO, president of ProMedica, a large healthcare system based in Ohio, but serving 30 states with 56,000 employees and uh, 1,000 uh, provider physicians in, in uh, 700 different locations, I at believe. At the time, yeah, yeah, at a time. Yeah. So a huge healthcare system. And Randy is going to speak to us tonight based upon his experience leading this very large healthcare system. Just a couple words about who this gentleman is. Um, Randy holds, um, obviously, a bachelor's degree, two master's degrees, a doctorate in management, and he's um, also distinguished himself uh, by being uh, honored to be a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. This gentleman is highly credentialed, and he has had a long, stellar career in healthcare, and tonight he's going to share his vision for the good, the bad, and the ugly of the healthcare system, and most importantly, a call for a new model. So, Randy, welcome. Great. We're glad you're here. Thank you. So it was uh, one of those great Saturday mornings, you know, the kind where you, you don't have anything on Friday night, and Saturday morning you have nothing, you have nothing the rest of the day. Uh, young man is in bed, he uh, jumps out of bed, he's going to the kitchen to get a second cup of coffee, and uh, he comes back, he's got the second cup of coffee in his hand, and his wife's standing in the door of the bathroom, she said, hon, hey, come here, I want to show you something, and there on the sink counter was a positive pregnancy stick. Very, very excited, and they hug, they jump back in bed, and they begin to talk about all the sort of things you would do when you first found out you're going to have a child, you know, um, what, are you going to have a boy or a girl, can you imagine we're going to be parents? Um, you know, can I work? Uh, should we get a bigger house? When do we tell our mom and dad? All these great things that you think about and so excited. So Monday comes around. Um, they make the appointment with an obstetrician. And later in the week, they got an appointment and uh, took the day off and went into the ob office. And again, typical of what you'd expect, fill out a bunch of forms, get your insurance information, uh, you know, um, get get back into the exam area and do weights and blood pressures and all those good things. And uh, then they were put into one of the exam rooms. And then one of the staff people was very excited and talking about, you know, walking to the group and all the great things. And she began to go over the information that they had provided. And suddenly she um, got very, very quiet. And she said, um, the doctor will be in to see you shortly. A couple kind of noticed the change in tone. Um, kind of looked at each other and just sat there quietly, which seemed like a long, long time. And then finally, the doctor came into the room. And after some pleasantries and uh, talking about the group and the excitement of being pregnant, she says, well, um, I'm very concerned about your baby. And she pulls up the stool and, and uh, sits next to him and says, you know, um, I'm, I'm concerned about the baby's diagnosis. And they go, like, Diagnosis. Um, it's our first visit. And uh, the doctor goes, Well, um, you are a 43601. And the couple look at her and go, Well, what does that mean? And they go, That's our zip code. And the doctor says, Exactly. In America, the five most important numbers in healthcare is where you were born. We can talk a lot about everything else, but where you were born, who your parents were, the opportunities you had in life. Uh, did you have education? Did you get early education? Did you have a good environment? Did you have uh, food on your tables? Did you have utilities? Did you have access to care? All those things are critically important and more critically important than anything we do in clinical medicine. We're gonna talk about that tonight. So what's interesting about America is the differences in life expectancy. And so when you begin to look at this chart and you see where Michigan is relative to life expectancy, so people in Michigan can be about a 30 year difference depending on where you live. And it's true in many of the major cities in all parts of America. So where you live matters. And so you can be blocks apart, and so this is actually a map of Detroit, and so in the red areas, you're gonna to live to be 60. In the green areas, you're gonna to live to be more like 90. 30 years difference in life expectancy. So how does that happen? 
in, in neighborhoods so close to each other? Why is there a 30-year difference? And that really is true across the United States of America. And yet, you'd kind of be puzzled why that is. Don't they have good hospitals there? What's the same market? Don't they have good doctors there? What's the issue there? And so those are the sort of things that when we think about health here in America, and we're going to kind of unpack a lot of different things tonight, those are the things that we're concerned about. So in America, our life expectancy has kind of fallen over the years. And there are reasons for that. And again, I think some of these statistics you need to take just a little bit with a grain of salt because a little bit has to do how countries report their statistics and look at. So we used to be in the middle of a pack, but now we're at the bottom of the pack. And what people will say is what's more important than anything else is social economic status and the social factors that have more to do with your health than anything that happens in a clinical setting. And so for those people who work in clinical setting, when you need it, you need it. But day in, day out, your health and well-being isn't impacted by that. So that makes sense. Uh, hopefully, most of you don't hang out at hospitals and hang out at your doctor's office unless you've got something going on. And so, but when you need it, you need it. But otherwise, your health and well-being are, are factored by so many different issues. In fact, um, this last quote, social underfunding in this country has more to do with health and well-being than actually how we fund health care. And uh, we're going to talk more about it tonight. And so really, the issue, this is a song from YouTube, is like it's, it's really interesting to say, you know, where, where you live or whether you die, shouldn't, it shouldn't really matter where you, where you live in life. And then what we're going to talk about, and this is an area that get, makes people uncomfortable, but it's something that's come, to, uh, come up more over the last four or five, six years, is the idea of your color of your skin matters about how you're treated in American healthcare. And there's studies after studies, and we can talk more about it. And uh, there are statistics we've known for a long, long time. And it's just because of some of the things that have happened culturally in America that we're paying much more attention to it. So um, we um, are a member, we the United States, of the OCED, OECD, the um, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. There are 38 countries um, that are part of that. And these are countries that work together. They're mostly democracies, that it's all about economic development and trying to do the right things uh, to make lives better. And yet, when we compare ourselves to these countries, we look very, very bad. We have more preventable diseases. Uh, we have higher uh, health care costs, dramatically higher health care costs. And we have lower life expectancy than many of these other OECD countries. And so you, you stop there. Now, uh, this is where we start to get nervous with if the audience is health care people. But we have a great health care system, and we have, a, we have the best health care system in the world. And we do at times. Um, and so it's kind of how you want to define that. But when you start going through the list, again, about life expectancy, um, we have some of the highest uh, infant mortality and maternal mortality rates in the world. And we compare very, very poorly against these other countries that we would want to compare ourselves to. Um, we have high suicide rates. Um, we have, um, you know, uh, we see physicians less. Um, we have a lot of people that are uninsured and underinsured, which is a bigger issue in this country. And we have very, very high obesity rates. And the problem here is just, again, when we compare it, as you look at these different countries, there's just a number of countries here. No matter what uh, time frame you look at it, we come out about the same. And so if you look at the uh, United States on the right, those darker numbers are the lower numbers. So even when we start to think about we're the United States of America, we should be the best, when we compare ourselves against all these metrics, we don't look really um, as good as you would expect we were. And there, there are reasons for that, and we're going to talk more about that tonight. So what's interesting from an individual standpoint, and this is the scary things, um, one in four Americans report that what they worry about in life is health care and health care costs. So that's an issue. So people sit around thinking about um, what that's going to do to their family. One in three Americans reporting that they can't access care. They can't access care because of cost. Problem. And this statistic, um, the first time I heard it, I didn't believe it. Um, but it's come out several different times. 34 million Americans, 13% of our population, say uh, they know somebody who died prematurely because they couldn't afford care. So. Um, that's a problem. Uh, when you begin to think about the United States of America, and it's complicated. So um, we can start you know, pointing fingers at things, and we're going to try to uh, talk a little bit about that tonight. But really, when we look at healthcare, care, um, there's a lot of opportunities um, to, do, to do better things. 
So um, different statistics. This is the waste that people documented in healthcare, and it's usually somewhere between 500 billion and 900 billion dollars of waste. So when we talk about new ideas and new things, people go, "Oh, how are you going to pay for that?" We'll start here. And there's you know studies that talk about how this waste is and about how we sometimes order tests because we're worried about malpractice and things that were required and extra administrative costs and the list just goes on and on and on, and it's a problem. And so what's interesting when you begin to look at where we're at in the United States and where we're going, um, the question is is what's going to change? So a really interesting map here, and as you look over um, uh, the gray column is the dates. And then the uh, green column going down is the percent of the GDP. And as you're going to notice, about 1950s, 1960s, uh, we started to get 5% of the GDP, and people started to freak out. And they go, like, this is a runaway train, uh, healthcare taking 5% of our gross domestic product. And then a whole bunch of things have happened since then. And so you, you look at the things, and we could add a lot more on the left side. All these things have happened, but what, what's happened to costs? They keep going up. And they keep going up and up. And so today, we're at 18% of the GDP, $4 trillion. And the projections are that we're going to be north of 20%. Some people would say in 2040, we're going to be um, at um, almost like 26%. And maybe as high as $12 trillion. And then people go, wow, well, that's not going to happen. Well, look at the trajectory. What, we've done all these things, Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act, um, you know, all these other things that have happened, the Deficit Reduction Act, uh, HMOs, um, uh, DRGs coming in is changing how hospitals got paid. And now the buzzwords are, you know, um, we, we have things like population health and value-based value health, the new buzzwords of the day. But again, when you think about aging of America, there's no way to change that. It's because as you age, you use healthcare more, and so use rates go up as you age. So, so we're going to get to a point where 20%, 25% of our GDP is spent on healthcare. So there's a debate, you know, what should that number be? A lot of people think it should be around 15%. Some people say it could be, some economists would argue it would be a little higher because it's a great way to employ people. But the question is, what does this do to people? And again, there's a very big difference when we start to look at people and how this, this affects people in life. So there's a lot of good in healthcare. And um, I want to try to balance this out a little bit. And so there's a lot of great things in healthcare. And people get up every day in a whole variety of industries in healthcare and do their best jobs and think they're doing good for society. And it's a very complicated, complex issue that we're going to talk a little bit about it. But it starts with people. We have great people in healthcare. Um, you know, I, I look at physicians. Um, to be a physician in this country, um, you got to work your butt off in college to get into medical school. Medical school is not much fun. And it's worse because you go to your residency, um, and uh, that's a tough road. Uh, you call them residents because they used to be residents of the hospital. They lived in the hospital. Uh, and then they go on to fellowship. So they're 30 plus years old with a massive amount of debt, and they get out of school, and they work their butts off. So I'm, I'm not here to complain about physicians. I have great admiration for physicians and nurses and uh, physical <laughs> therapists and pharmacists and all the staff people work in healthcare. So there's a lot of great. And when you begin to look at the list, we've had some great things happen in healthcare that we've all been beneficiaries of and things that have, have made life better, whether vaccines, um, the treatments for cancer have just been uh, amazing, what's been happening with treatment of cancer. Uh, the ability to get new knees, um, you know, um, new ankles, you, you, you name joints that you may need to have replaced. Amazing what, what can happen. And, and basically do that in 24, 48 hours and you're back, back out on the street. Um, you know, things like surgical breakthroughs, um, uh, treatment of heart, stroke, pain management. You can go down the whole list here. And you say there's really been a lot of great things in healthcare. And we should feel really, really good about that. Uh, and, and so... We, we have to think about all these things and all the great things in healthcare, but then we have to balance it out with some facts. And these facts are what are, are really, really um, troubling. And we can just kind of go through the list here. First off, we spend a lot of money. And we already talked about that. There's $4 trillion and it keeps going up. We talked about people not being able to afford care. That's a problem. Um, 30 million Americans are uninsured. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in Iowa. 
Uh, that bothers me. You know, it bothers me that we've got people that are uninsured. And I read something the other day about um, an article um, about a columnist and talked about the people who failed in the American marketplace, like somehow they deserved this because they didn't compete well in the American marketplace. But 30 million, the, the, the more concerning number to me is 85 million. So 85 million people are uninsured and underinsured. And underinsurance is a big issue. So you have insurance, and it's like, oh, you have insurance, you're great. You can't, you can't afford the deductibles. And we see that over and over again. And those are issues, and, and, and really tough issues. And we talked about people dying prematurely. We talked about minorities reporting significant differences in care, and uh, we'll, ch we'll chat a little bit more about that. And then just some of these troubling uh, trends. Uh, maternal uh, mortality, infant mortality. Um, I live in Ohio. Ohio used to be 49th in America for infant mortality, babies dying in the first year of life. Uh, today, uh, Michigan and Ohio are both in the 40s, when you look at the 50th states, for uh, infants dying in the first year of life. Um, maternal mortality, uh, Ohio is in the, the 40s. Um, you know, they're, they're one of the worst states, they're in the bottom 10. Michigan's a little higher for maternal mortality, dying uh, from, from having a baby. And yet, you look at those things and you think like, you know, that shouldn't happen in the United States of America, but, and why? Why does that happen? Is it, oh, they must not have good health care. Well, you know, uh, and what we're going to talk about today is there's a lot of other things uh, that are at play here, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about it. And then again, we just don't live the healthiest of lives sometimes, which we all know about, and, and can be a real, real issue for us as well. Um, we talked about waste. We talked about some of the unnecessary stuff. Um, medical debt um, is a huge social issue. And uh, number one cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States, medical debt. And uh, so when you begin to look at that and you think about it, and we talk a lot about debt, we talk about student loan debt, and we talk very little about medic medical debt, and you begin to look at the numbers here that are on, you know, how many people have medical debt, number one, personal bankruptcy, the size of medical debt. And, you, and you, again, you go like, wait a minute. So we're taking care of people, and yet we're putting such a debt load on them that they can't ever recover. And so when we look at that, we go, boy, that, that can't continue. And yet it asks you today, what's, what's going to change uh, in, in our healthcare system? And those are the things that we worry about. So the word that sometimes describes, and, and uh, healthcare people hate this word, but it's this industrial medical complex. And the idea behind an industrial medical complex is that this is an industry. It's a massive industry. And, uh, and every one of the buckets that you have here, whether it's um, hospitals and health systems, they get up every day and they're do, trying to do the best job for their hospitals. So I've been on a lot of hospital boards um, over my um, 40 years. And I'll tell you, if you get all the hospitals in a room, they, they, they can only agree on certain things. They can agree on certain quality things you know, patient safety, and don't cut my revenue. And outside of that, they don't can't agree on too much because they're all different. And that's true with a lot of these industries. I mean, they're out, every single one of them, to be able to just continue to do what they're doing. Not necessarily bad in some ways. Um, the total effect is bad. But yet, from a company standpoint, if you're in a company, you're like, yes, if you're selling, if you're in the uh, big pharma area, you sell drugs. That's what we do. We make money selling drugs. If um, you're in um, a physician world, it's physician's insurance. You know, I'll, I'll give you some numbers here. Um, the six, I'm sorry, the top eight uh, insurance companies uh, in 2022, 800 billion in revenue. And they made, uh, made about uh, $41 billion. The 10 largest pharmaceutical companies, um, $734 billion in revenue, and they made $136 billion in profit. The companies who sell medical devices, so again, just all the stuff that goes on in healthcare, $188 billion uh, in revenue. And um, hospitals, you know, um, take about a third of our, our expenditures in this country, and some people say there's about $200 billion in assets there. And then medical supplies, people provide medical supplies in 2022, it was $196 billion. So um, it's big, big, big business. So all of these organizations are getting up every day and trying to make sure that their business model, um, business model will, will be sustained, will keep going. So who's going to raise their hand of that group and say, I think we need to do a whole new model in, in, in um, stop, uh, stop having insurance in the United States. 
Yeah, it's just, there's just no way to happen. And the other thing that they're, um, which is concerning, two things. Um, uh, the healthcare industry uh, last year spent over $700 billion, um, I'm sorry, $700 million, almost a billion dollars, uh, lobbying uh, government. So again, so then you think about how does government start to agree on anything where in their particular area they have an insurance company or a big pharma company or these things. So you have all this, you know, kind of discrepancies about what people want to do and how they want to do it. Um, read the other day that pharma uh, in 2022 spent a billion dollars a month advertising drugs. So you begin to start to see how this thing gets really complex and it, it just keeps going and going and going. And so, you know, what happens along the way is, and then there's this relationship between, you know, uh, people are lobbyists and then they, they work for the government and then they are lobbyists or they work in pharma and then they're at part of the FDA, the CDC, and they go back and forth. And it's just this whole relationship that we've created in this country. And then you say, how do we, how do we begin to change that? How do you kind of get new things? And so um, this slide basically says that, okay, um, get what you've been harping on here, but you, we got to be careful because we, we can't paint this all with one big brush that everything's bad. There are organizations that are doing uh, God's work, no doubt about it. They are mission-based. They get up every day. They're doing the right things. And so um, it's not to say some aren't, but, but the idea that they're all the same is, is not necessarily true. And so we, we have to think about that a little bit when we, we talk about answers and how we look at the industry as a whole. So, you know, one of the things that happened during COVID, and COVID was, um, you know, I think if you talk to caregivers, the worst part of their careers. Um, I had a, a, a physician and nurse tell me one day, you know, they're used to taking care of people in hospitals and sending them home. And now they watch them die. And the family wasn't there. And the effect on caregivers um, over that period of COVID in hospitals was really dramatic. And so we saw people get tremendously burned out. And then there's just all the other intricacies of medicine that have made it difficult. Um, I know a lot of young physicians, and they, they work till 6 o'clock. They go home. They try to have dinner with their family. And then they spend the rest of the night doing medical records. And uh, we're supposed to have electronic records. They're supposed to help. So Clayton Christensen, great speaker, um, known for innovation, um, you know, Harvard professor, um, wrote a lot of work about innovation. He wrote the best work. Um, how many of you read How Do You Measure Your Life? Have you ever read that, Clayton Christian? It's fantastic. He was asked to do a speech to, um, digressing here, um, a class, a Harvard class, a business school class, and they, they asked him to speak not about business, but what they should do with it in their lives. And so he wrote this great book about how to measure your life. But what he said, uh, and he's probably one of the you know, most respected minds, um, and he passed away uh, a few years ago, but he really said healthcare is a terminal illness. And it's a terminal illness uh, for our government and businesses, and we're in big trouble. And um, again, you don't see that at a lot of healthcare conferences. Uh, but but you know, we're in big trouble. What are we going to do about it? And so what happens is, you know, um, you know, people uh, do a lot of things in healthcare, and yet we don't seem to address some of the major problems. We were um, in a senator's office a few years ago, and we were talking about some of these social issues and things to invest in. And the senator's staff person interrupted us and said, no, 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 we're, we're looking at more important issues. And the issue was price transparency. So I should have kept my mouth shut, but I said, oh, great. You're going to show people the, um, uh, that's a bad sign. You're going to show people the bills they can't afford. That's, that's really what you're pushing here. And it's really that. I mean, it's those sort of priorities. And just over the years, as you talk to different legislators, well, it's too busy. We're impeaching this person. Well, this person resigns, so we've got to get somebody new. And there's just not a lot of political will and motion in place to do it. And a, a quote from the Commonwealth Fund, who's really well known in healthcare, basically says, we spend a lot of money. We're really not getting what we, what we should for our money. And we can do better. And I think that's the question here for us all. How can we do better in life? And so this is a, a, a word I like. It's called anosognosia. And it is basically um, the inability to perceive reality. And so it's really not believing your diagnosis. And it's really not believing the diagnosis that we have healthcare. So I, I gave this talk to a bunch of um, healthcare management people. 
and it didn't go very well. Uh, they, they did not like the tone of it, and I was trying to balance out the tone, and the, the comment was, well, Randy, you're being awfully harsh. And it's like, yeah, but just look at the results on people's lives. Uh, are we being overly harsh? And yet what happens is you get in your own little silo, and so you go to a physician conference, you talk about all the great things going on in a physician, or you go to a hospital conference, hear about all the great things in hospitals, or you go to a, a place where they, you know, maybe it's pharmaceutical drugs, you hear all about the things. But we don't necessarily always talk about these other issues and the issues that are uh, um, hurting people every day. So this organization I worked for about 15 years ago, we decided to do something nice um, for them. Um, we mainly worked in Northwest Ohio, Southeast Michigan. And we decided to create um, some materials for obesity. So we created these learning maps, these hunger bo their boxes, and they had these huge maps. And they were for students and teachers, and we put them into schools and places like the Y and different social clubs. And um, we, we started training kids how to eat healthy. And uh, this went on for, for several months. And um, thought everything was going well. And the uh, trainers asked for a meeting. And at the meeting, um, they weren't um, necessarily all that happy about the program. And what they said was, yeah, these kids are hungry. And um, you know, the people that were meeting with them said, no, no, no. We didn't sign up for hunger. Uh, we signed up to tell people how to eat healthy. And they go, they're hungry. And they don't have food. And so um, what was interesting about that, um, Hunger, um, we, we make it many times a political issue in this country. It is a major health care issue, and it makes sense. Healthy moms and healthy babies. If you don't have a well-nourished mother and well-nourished children, what is that going to do to the rest of their lives? And yet we end up debating this and fighting about it and talking about who's worthy or not. Um, again, just a personal opinion. I would err on the, the side of giving people food. So again, look at some of these stats. 10% of households food insecure, 12% uh, with uh, kids. 24% single moms and kids are food insecure. 24%. used to be 33%. That means for a family of four, uh, collectively, they miss 100 meals a month. So think about that from a learning standpoint, kids in school. Think about that from a healthcare standpoint. And then again, depending uh, you know, your resources, you're buying things that you can afford. And many times, these aren't the best things to eat, but they're cheap. So you have to be forced to buy it. Or you may not live in a neighborhood that's got a, a grocery store and you may have to take multiple buses to get there, and it's really, really difficult, and especially for people of aging. Um, seniors are a big issue in this country. Not reported well. Seniors aren't good at reporting when they have problems. As we're all kind of stubborn as we can get a little older in life here. Uh, and um, a huge problem in America, medical debt and this idea that seniors are hungry. And so we're going to see this play out more and more as we think about in the country. Um, we started to lobby um, our I, um, House of Reps and Senators in Michigan and Ohio about, about the Ag Bill. And I remember the first time we went to somebody talking about the Ag Bill, and they go, like, what in the heck are you doing here talking about the Ag Bill? It's like SNAP benefits. It's SNAP benefits. It's, it's SNAP benefits is these, these benefits we provide to people to have food. Food is critical. Um, we started doing tons and tons of work with food and um, worked and, uh, you know, it was real clear that when we talked to people, the effects of bad nutrition on health. The list just goes on and on. And so when you think about just some of the most basic things, I can probably get an MRI easier than I can get food sometimes. And so that, that's a problem. So you look at the physical and the ongoing health, the development needs of kids, the effects on pregnant women. And you begin to look at that whole list and you're thinking like poor nutrition on health. Why wouldn't we do more about that? But again, we. We again, and I'm sure we could get in this debate tonight. Yeah, but, you know, I'll quote this article I read. There, these are people failing in the marketplace, so it is what it is, but yet you look at those issues and the impact on, on health. But yet, we're spending $4 trillion, and we're on our way to $12 trillion, and yet we're not doing these sort of things. So, it, um, again, I grew up in Iowa. That defies logic in some ways to me that we don't think more about these things and its effect, uh, effect on health. So. Um, health care is critically important, and when you need it, you need it. But when you actually look at your health and well-being, it's a very small factor. 
Uh, and yet we spend a lot of money and it consumes a lot of our economy. And this is a slide that, again, you didn't see this 10 years ago. Um, now social determinants have gotten a little bit in vogue, especially with insurance companies, because they figured out it saves them money. But really what you see on the top there, social factors, physical environment, that really has to do a lot with, your, with the zip code that you were born in. Those factors are much more important than the 20% of healthcare. But yet, again, we're spending $4 trillion, 18% of our GDP on that 20%. And all the other things um, we don't necessarily talk about. So it doesn't make sense when you've gone to a doctor in the past, they didn't ask you if you had food on your table, if you could afford the, the medication I'm going to give you. Do you have utilities at home? Are you a victim of domestic violence? Do you have uh, the ability to get a job and pay for these things? Um, those sort of social issues, aren't those critically important when you think of your health and well-being? Do you have a social structure? Do you, uh, you know, those things are critically important when you think about health and well-being. And yet, our model has been, and this is really the crux of the model, it's the model that kind of developed in America that's been the problem. And that's the thing that we need to look at. So we started screening for social determinants of health. That's this SDOH. And these things are critically important in people's lives. And you can kind of see the things up there for yourselves. You know, things like food security, critically important. Um, we used to say the best thing you can do is um, give someone a job. Uh, mental health, we'll talk about that in a little bit, huge issue in America. Uh, social connections, if you have social connections, um, there's been a lot. Um, have you seen the Blue Zones on Netflix? It's the big new thing right now, Dan Buettner. So he wrote this book uh, a long time ago, and he went around um, the world and uh, studied uh, people who live a long, long time. And there were certain places, uh, a couple in the United States, but mostly around the world where people live a long time. One of the most critical things for them is, is social interaction. They have daily social interaction. And we've seen that actually, um, it's a great study, um, there are heat waves in Chicago. There would be buildings where some, a lot of people would pass away and then other buildings where people lived. And they were like, what? They're, they're the same environment and everything. And usually the, the, the apartments where they had multiple generations living were the ones that survived the most. It was all, all social connections. Um, you know, financial strain, um, you know, if you think about financial strain and what that does to a person, if they, they you know, if they got that running through their head all, all day, housing insecurity, transportation, utilities, you know, domestic violence, child care, you know, or whether or not um, you have education. And then more recently, this idea of the digital divide. Not everybody has access to the internet. And, you know, if you don't have it, does that, that um, provide you some problems. So the interesting thing about this, this is really important for patients. It's really important for everybody. So think about what work. Um, people come to work every day with these social issues going on in their life. So even from an employer, from a business standpoint, um, how effective do you think your employee is if they're a, a victim of predatory lending? Or they're worried about losing their house? or they're living out of their car. I remember the first time we found out one of our managers was living out of a car. Um, long story, complicated, um, domestic violence involved, and um, a, a woman found herself with her children in a car. You know, those sort of things in life, not only from a healthcare standpoint, but also from just from an employment and life standpoint, are critically important. Those are the sort of things that, you know, that we started to look at. And then again, as we think about these things, we have some critical shortages that help us address some of these issues. And the two issues that, that we'll talk about is we do really poorly in primary care and we do really poorly in mental health. And we can change that. Pretty easy to change. Pay those people more. Pretty simple, but yet we don't. So if you're a physician and you can uh, go into a, a various fields, and unless you're passionate about a field, and I can go into this field, primary care, but I can be a specialist, I can probably make twice as much money. Um, and again, we have a model that really uh, puts a high priority on specialty care, which can be good. I'm not saying it's, it's good, but, but the idea is the incentives there, and especially for mental health as well, there's just no incentives to go into those fields a lot of times. And could, we could do a better job by incentivizing people. Perhaps we need to take money away from specialists. Be careful where we say that uh, with physicians in the room. Perhaps we need to change that over a period of time. But those, again, decisions we could make in order to change priorities. And then these are some of the stats for mental health. And I think um, we all know our mental health crisis in the United States. And so we have people that are waiting forever to get care. You just can't get care. Every community has a mental health problem in uh, having providers provide mental health. 
And then again, when you see all the impacts of COVID, um, the amount of depression that we've seen with people, um, you know, especially young people, it's quite staggering. And again, um, it, it seems to be getting worse and our suicides uh, rates are, are really bad. So um, in Michigan and Ohio, in March, a lot of times we get snows toward, um, you know, those days where we get 60 degrees and we get the heavy, heavy snows. So um, uh, Harold uh, decided that he was going to go out and scoop his driveway. Heavy snow, a couple inches. Starts to put on his hat and his uh, mittens and his coat. And he's getting ready to go out. And his wife goes, Harold, you are not going to go shovel snow. And he goes, I can do this. I'm going to take it easy. And uh, I know what I'm doing. So, uh, you know, typical, you know, you're nodding, yes. Uh, his typical husband, he's going to go out and do it anyway. So he goes out and his wife watches him for a few minutes. And um, he seems to be fine, um, goes um, into the kitchen a little bit, comes back, and of course, you know what happens, Harold's on the ground. And uh, calls 911, um, take Harold to the emergency room, and do a whole variety of tests, and Harold uh, has had a heart attack. And so, um, you know, begin to look at everything, and finally, um, the emergency physician comes in to see him, and, you know, talks to Harold and his wife and says, yes, um, you know, you've had a heart attack. But, you know, um, I've been putting a plan together for you. And uh, I'm not going to refer you to a cardiologist, but you, you probably should be referred to a cardi cardiologist, but I'm not going to. And, you know, I probably should uh, put you in a cardiac unit. You know, yeah, I'm not going to do that either. Um, and, uh, you know, probably a candidate for a heart failure clinic. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably not going to do that either. And, uh, you know, um, probably, you'll probably be back here in 30 days. So, yeah, that's kind of the way it is. And the couple is looking at the physician and go, what? You know, what's this about? And the answer is, Harold, you're a black man. Now, that's true. Everything up there, if you look at statistics about black men and white men for the heart attack, those are exactly true, true stories. It's, it's not fun to hear that. So um, these the stories started to come out about discrimination in healthcare. And uh, I remember I'd have... Well, retired board members call me and go, like, you need to do something about this. You need to counteract all this stuff because this is not right. And it's like, yeah, but it's true. Um, one of our physicians who was an obstetrician, and he, he was thinking, like, you know, I, I don't think I discriminate. Uh, so he had um, went back and uh, looked at certain things that he had taken care of, and um, he had his staff pull all the data. And when he looked at how he treated white women and black women, completely different. He said, I gave white women a lot more options. And so when you begin to look at a lot of these race sort of issues, again, nobody thinks they're biased or racist or anything. But again, I think when you start to le read these stories, um, have you, any of you read the S Serena Williams Olympic player, greatest woman tennis player of all the time, almost died in childbirth? Because the staff kept telling her, honey, you're fine. And she had a pulmonary embolism, almost, almost died of it. So again, it's those sort of things that are uncomfortable to talk about, but those are the sort of things that we really need to come to grips with that we're gonna make our system a little better. I have another story I won't bore with you tonight, but it's um, a single mom uh, and uh, being told she has breast cancer, then also being told that um, the system is going to bankrupt her and probably affect the rest of her lives. And those are the things that happen in life. So here's the deal. These are the stats from Ohio. And uh, on the left side are the statistics for Ohio and, and various times how they did in different rankings. And as you'll see, they are usually in the bottom 10 states in the United States. Bottom 10 states. So they must have really poor health care in Ohio. They must not have enough doctors. Oh, yeah, you got the Cleveland Clinic and Ohio State and the ProMedicas and a couple of universities. And Cincinnati Children's arguably is probably one of the top two or three children's hospitals in the world. But yet, there must be something that's missing there. And, and the issue is real clear, it's social issues. So you begin to look at the left side, and you begin to look at the right side, and we spend all this money on the right side, and again, worked my whole career there and, and was part of that. And yet, on the left side, those are issues, and in, in, a, uh, in a weird way, Ohio has a lot of big cities, a lot of big issues that really relate to these social determinants of health. So um, a thing that happens a lot now when you go to healthcare meetings is like, are we at this tipping point? Are things going to radically change now? And um, no, uh, they're not. But we keep talking about it. Are we at some sort of tipping point? Now, COVID did tip things, I have to admit. But the question is, we're going to keep going down this clinical path and the path that we're on today and uh, just the things that you know about American healthcare um, and all the other things that go with it. Or are we going to do something different? 
And so that's, that's the concern here is like, uh, what's going to take for us to go a different path? And again, it's not the people. And I would argue a lot of times it's not the organizations. It's the model that's developed over these years. And how are we going to change this model? So Jim Collins um, was a Stanford professor, What a great book called Good to Great. And uh, it's why these companies make the leap for success. I think um, he had 21 research people on this for five years, and they looked at thousands of pages of data and did a couple thousand interviews, and really took 150 companies, 148 companies, and said, these are the 11 best companies. These are people that are good to great. They made the leap for what was best. And uh, I remember when I read it, I thought, boy, this is one of the best books I've ever read. He wrote a better book. It's 36 pages. It's called Good to Great in the Social Sectors. It took longer to write the 36 pages, I've read this several different times, than it did to write Good to Great. And what he says in there, and if you look at the, the caption on the top, business thinking isn't the answer. Yeah. And so what he says there, and I think this is a great thought in life, what matters is the impact we make, uh, no matter where we are in life, relative to our resources. So everybody in this room has different resources. Our countries have different resources, organizational. And yet, you ask yourselves, well, what's this impact that we're trying to make in life? And so I always think, you know, I'm a religious person. I'm going to be judged someday for the resources that I've uh, had available to me in my life and what I did with them. And so. Um, you think about that and think like, well, what kind of impact are we making? What are we doing with resources? So hospitals, like a lot of nonprofits, began you know, decades ago to become more business-like. That's exactly what we wanted them to do. We put business people on their boards, we became very business-like. Um, we wanted to have more revenue, and we wanted to have more market share, we wanted to have more net income, which was all good. I'm not saying that's bad. Um, but on the other hand, um, which was, well, it was kind of amazing when we had people in companies or in companies that wanted the revenues of the hospital to go up. Does that make any sense? I mean, would you want those to go down if you're a business? I would think so. But anyway, um, and, and so what happens is you begin to start to ask yourself these questions about the impact you're trying to make. You know, and, and so every one of the part of the industry that we're talking about, we have to ask impact questions. And really, are we doing the right things in life and where we want to go? And so that's our question. You know, what's kind of the impact that we want to make in life? Um, and again, again, are we creating the environment to think about things from an innovation standpoint that are going to allow us to do the type of things that we want to do to, to really make the impact? So this is a map, um, and you know, again, don't worry uh, about reading this, but this is really kind of a journey we went on in the organization I worked for. And it really started with hunger screening. So um, not many people were screening for food insecurity, and people complained. And um, we started screening for food insecurity. We asked people questions. We asked motivational questions if they were motivated to change their life. Have you ever been in a health system and asked um, um, about food insecurity? Any of you? Yeah, a couple of you. It's more common now, uh, but at the time, um, it, it was it, it, it was, wasn't necessarily thought well of. I remember uh, some of our physicians thought it was kind of crazy. Um, but what happened was, so we started this hunger journey. I remember we went to um, the hunger organizations, uh, Bread for the World, Alliance State Hunger, um, Feed America, Share Our Strength, Mobile Meals, went to the USDA, went to the Ag Department, and we were at Bread for the World, and a uh, guy named Re Re Reverend David Beckman. Most people ask, like, why are you here? It's like, well, we're interested in hunger, and, and hunger is a health issue. And uh, Reverend Beckman um, uh, took about 10 minutes and he goes, why are you here? And then after 10 minutes, um, fits his personality, goes, where have you been? You should have been here years ago. We sh you should have been working on this years ago. And really, it's those sort of things that are pretty easy to do these days and then to provide needs, to provide help to people. And so what we ended up doing is um, partnering with the AARP. We began to screen for all the social determinants of health. And uh, we, uh, re we addressed, took some of our philanthropy money and put it toward, toward these sort of issues. And then we had a donor, a uh, gentleman named Russ Ebide, who was the president of Guardian Glass in Detroit, one of the largest glass companies in the world. He gave us um, almost $50 million to take a part of Toledo, Ohio, and put 20-some people uh, boots on the ground trying to work in a neighborhood to try to change lives. Uh, and these are long, these are long projects. And if you know Jeffrey Canada's work in the Harlem Kids Zone, very, very similar to that. Um, one of the things we ended up doing is building an inner city grocery store, because there was no grocery store. And uh, we went to all the grocers. Nobody would help us. 
They weren't even that nice to us. So we got into the grocery business and actually uh, ended up helping a lot of other uh, nonprofits um, start grocery stores because it wasn't a model that fit the, the corporate model. And what happened though is we started to do more and more things that started to build on that and really believing that these social determinants of health was really a key part of people's overall health and well-being. One of the things that we promised Mr. by that we would change 10,000 lives when we did this and so we had a whole variety of metrics that we, we were looking at and trying to report on and uh, trying to do the sort of things um, that, that we thought would matter. What was interesting when we started screening people, um, we'd ask motivational questions. And this is the time where somebody goes, well, all those people, they're just not motivated to change their lives. 95% uh, of people said they were motivated to change their life. I believe it was 100%, but 5% probably didn't dare to say so. They just didn't know how. And so sometimes when we've grown up in a way that we have access, you know, if your car breaks, you take someone else's car, or you call your kids, or your, or your significant other, your spouse, and you take their car. For a lot of people, you lose your car, your job, you're done. And, and if you don't have the money to replace it. So it's all sort of issues in life that really impact people a lot. And so really what happened is we started finding people with all these social issues. So these things happen in healthcare, but they also happen at work. So even as you think about employer, there's a company um, in uh, Ann Arbor, um, a guy named Vic Strecker, has a company called Kumano. And they screen, they work with employers, they screen for social determinants of health and life purpose. And so what they do is they work with employers to try to look at these issues in their employees. And yet all the data is really interesting. So this is um, some of the nutrition screening that we did. And it's all the things that you would want to do. Um, it's reductions in ER use, reductions in uh, people going into the hospital, increases in primary care, and we saw those kind of statistics both in the Medicaid population and the Medicare population. So just one social determinant, if you start to do these interventions in people's lives socially, that it worked out very, very well. And so we did a whole variety of things. We had um, uh, food, um, we did food prescriptions. Because a lot of times if you talk, talk to people about food, they didn't want charity. But when the doctor wrote a script, they would take the script, they would go to a, uh, something that looked like a market, um, you know, pretty plain doors. And then what would happen was um, the uh, dietitian would sit down with a person, talk about their health issues, talk about their budget, and try to help them create a budget that would work well um, for the money that they had. And it was really successful. We provide short-term food needs and a whole variety of things like that. And then we also did a lot in financial counseling. And so we um, got some grants to provide financial counseling. And so not only was it critical to patients, but it was also critical to some of our employees. And you can see the results, um, you know, $400 more a month. Um, I was amazed at how many people are the victims of predatory lending. Um, credit score increases. And again, the same sort of healthcare statistics. So we saw this over and over again. And see, that's why insurance companies are doing this now, because they start to see these sort of numbers. And again, when you see these numbers, you're like, why wouldn't we be doing this all the time, all day long, um, throughout healthcare? And so really, this model question is the question today is like, are we going to stay on the left side and just do clinical care? And I gave this talk to a group of um, uh, healthcare executives and uh, a physician who ran a very large health system, when I got done, put his hand up and said, I completely disagree with everything you just said. We have no business doing any of this stuff. We're not trained to do it. We're not paid to do it. My organization is not going to do this. And it's like, OK, well, I respectably disagree, but thank you for telling the group what you thought. But that's, some of the, that's a lot of the, the, the thinking in, in healthcare, though, yet, is that that's what we do. We, we're not responsible for anything over on the right side. Um, and that's, that's a little harsh. I know maybe it's over-exaggerating. But it's all these other things that you see on the right, which we kind of touched on tonight. Um, and um, again, it's, we can talk about ageism and, and the way seniors are treated in the United States. You know, talk a lot about society, how you treat your children and how you treat um, your seniors. And I think when you look at health care, I think we've got some issues there. The other thing, if you're interested, uh, ACEs are adverse child effects. The, um, if you look at children that are born uh, many times in poverty, but in very difficult situations, they build up chronic stress through their lives. They call these adverse child effects. Major impacts on people's lives. And yet, um, if you talk to a lot of people in healthcare, never heard of it, never talked about it, never thought about it. Pediatricians and a lot of pediatrics do. So the question is, do we start to blend that? Do we stay the same? What do we do? 
Uh, and is the status quo acceptable? You know, and so you ask yourself, is it acceptable or not? Um, you know, um, uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the, the problem here is what are we going to do about it? And who's going to change it? So um, the government, um, you know, uh, not today, uh, given our government. Um, so can hospitals and health systems just do it on their own? Well, first off, they're all independent organizations. And to get them to agree to change a model that's going to impact them negatively is pretty hard. Um, and that's the true with physicians. Insurance companies are going to say, we'll give up half our revenue, we'll give up half our profits. Uh, pharma, um, medical device, uh, group purchasing organizations. These are all people who make tons of money off of health care. And then you've got all the consultants, you've got the accountants, you've got the lawyers. It is a big industry. And it's a very, very complex industry. I used to think, uh, I used to advocate for a national commission on health. Um, the idea that you would get a national commission. We have a, um, a history of national commissions in the United States, time-limited commissions that get in, study an issue, make recommendations. The problem is, when you make the national commission, it's going to be all those people. And if you think about it, it's like, oh, I, don't know if I don't know if they're going to change anything. You know, how, yeah, how are you going to do it? So right now, it's interesting. I'm glad you, you pointed that out. So right now in America, hospitals are losing a battle. Uh, they're getting killed in Washington, D.C. There are people, uh, there are groups in Washington, D.C., um, and this is uh, just kind of, you know, uh, uh, inside baseball. Uh, the, the insurance companies love to push it off. It's the hospital's problems or pharma or vice versa. You always want to point it to the other, other uh, people. But there's a, a, um, a couple groups right now in D.C., literally hundreds of people on the ground lobbying against hospitals because certain people believe that hospitals are the problem. And so just as you look at all that, it's just kind of interesting to see how that's going to go. So really, you know, how, how do we get to it? And uh, the last bullet on there, I didn't mention it. I think it's the employers. The employers have to figure out a solution here. They have to get in a room. They tried it on a couple different ways. But really, I think it's the, uh, the, uh, the power of employers to be able to change the American healthcare system. Because again, when you look at all the pieces and parts of the healthcare system itself, uh, it's just going to be tough to get all those people to agree. So what, what would be some things to think about? So um, I think you need a phased-in plan. And the reason I think you need a phased-in plan um, is you've got to give people time to change. So you know, hospitals borrow money. They borrow money for facilities. If you radically change their finances, you're going to create uh, massive sort of problems. Um, if you have a young woman or a young, young man who decides to go into a specialty and spends you know, 10 years of their life getting there, and then they say, oh, well, oh by the way, we're going to cut your salary in half, I don't know if that's quite fair. I think, think you have to. And then I think you just got to give time for, for kind of the system to change. You know, part of it is, let's not make it worse. Let's begin to change. Um, I think it's hard to argue not to have universal coverage in the United States. I know this, and I'm sure there are people here that disagree with that. But we're, uh, of those OECD countries, we're one of the few, if, the, if not the only one, that doesn't provide some form of universal coverage. The fact that 83 million people are um, uninsured or underinsured should bother us. It should bother us a lot. We need to cap. Um, you know, we got to cap at some point how much money we want to spend on health care. We just got to got to do it. Some states have started to do it. Um, some people would argue 15 percent might be a little bit low, um, but um, uh, you know, 15 percent seems to be a, a, a good number along the way. Um, when you begin to look at some of the things that we need to prioritize, mental health, primary care. We need to make a lot more investments in mental health and primary care. We have to do something about pharmaceutical costs. We've done a couple things lately, which are kind of positive. You know, they've they made a few things. We pay way more pharmaceutical costs than anyone else in the, in the world. And we could do something about it. But the reason we don't do about it is why? Because there's $700 million of lobbying costs. Yeah, that, that happens in the United States. Um, you know, uh, insurance companies, I think we need to require a lot more insurance, uh, work of insurance companies. I've always thought that hospitals, um, again, this is a, a minority opinion, should be responsible for public health in the United States. Um, why not? I mean, they're, they're, many of them are nonprofit. Many of them, um, pre-COVID at least, had great resources. And I'm not always talking about money resources. I'm talking about people resources, physicians, 
um, you know, the ability to get things done. Great sort of uh, opportunities to get some things done. So I think primary care. And then I think just this whole idea of medical debt. I think we need to address those. So I, th I think as you begin to think about some of these issues, it clearly is an issue of the model uh, in the United States. And I think for, um, uh, you know, we've, we think about our path forward, you know, if, if I had one thought um, that I was going to talk to people about, it's employers uh, rallying together to begin to try to force change on an industry that is, is so siloed that they're not going to do it themselves. And again, I don't think government will do it until somebody puts pressure on them. And the people who have the most pressure are employers. So with that, I'm happy to take a few questions. Are these emergency rooms overburdened, over thing, and a five hour wait in an emergency room which you don't go to for a cut on your finger? Right, yeah. Well, part of the problem in uh, uh, emergency rooms is not everybody uses it for emergencies. Um, we've gotten better in this country, but um, a lot of people are in emergency rooms that really don't have emergencies. They, they should be at a primary care doctor, um, you know, there are a variety of reasons why people end up there. Um, you know, a lot of hospital people would say, you know, you probably question the staffing that's going on that particular day. Were there other traumas that got there before you that were taking all the staff's time, that they were in a trauma situation and they weren't allowed to? S but, but, you know, to your point, five-hour waits um, is, you know, really um, unacceptable. But sadly, it's typical. Now, especially when you end up in large trauma centers. Uh, that, that, that's not unusual, because they get, um, you know, they get a variety of, you know, whether it's automobile accidents or you know, shootings, all those sort of things happen in life. So uh, I don't have a better answer for you, but uh, it happens. Uh, people are aware of it. Um, and um, you know, it, it just, yeah. um, I have a question about the role of insurance companies practicing medicine. Um, I can think of three or four people that I personally know whose doctors have ordered one thing. Maybe they've been on a medication before two or three years ago. They know it doesn't work, but the insurance company insists that they try that again or do physical therapy for um, back pain that is excruciating and they've already done that. I just wonder, is there any research done on the role of insurance companies affecting the actual practice of medicine in that very specific way? Um, yeah, yes, and uh, a lot of insurance companies have been fined um, for just kind of wholeheartedly um, not approving anything. And so there are, you know, if you talk to a hospital or a physician office, they can tell you which insurance companies are better than others, but some are just horrible to deal with. They won't approve anything. So again, this is what I think some of the frustration for physicians, they get on the phone, they talk to an insurance company and say, this, this patient absolutely has to do it. And they're probably talking to a staff person with no clinical training who says no. And so, yeah, I think uh, um, I try not to rail too much about insurance companies, but I, I, um, uh, one of the, the, the slides up there is that we have a lot of middlemen actors that are, uh, to me, they're a sub-actor in this whole thing. They're, they're kind of stuck in the middle. And you really have to ask the value that insurance companies uh, bring in the United States. You'd think there'd be a way around it. Because again, I think if you think about you know, the profits that they're making and the role they play, there's got to be a better way. So. My question is about the countries that offer free health care. How is it that it works for them? How did they get to that point where they are offering free health care to their citizens? And is it working for them? Is it good, better? What, what's your opinion? Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, um, uh, what's interesting is there are countries that provide universal coverage, uh, and um, they, you know, they, they choose to spend their money that way. So, getting to see a primary care doctor, actually, in a lot of these countries, they see the doctor more than we do in America, and they have great access to like primary care and mental health services and all that. Now, um, we see that a lot in in places like Canada. You need a knee replace, you got to get in a queue. Um, and so, like states like Michigan and Wisconsin, of uh, the northern tiers of these states, they flourish because they get cash paying Canadians coming over the, over the, um, the border. So it's a, it's a bit of a trade off. And so um, we went down the route, and there's a variety, into very specialist oriented care. And, and there's reasons why that happened in the United States. Others went down the route of more primary care health and well-being type services, more social services. 
And, um, you know, um, it works for them. Now, again, heart surgery, um, transplantation, some of the high-tech things that we take for granted um, either aren't available or very difficult to access those kids. So it's a bit of a trade-off. And uh, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but that's, that's the trade-off they've made. I just wondered on the, uh, in terms of the health plan, you mentioned that the employers ought to take it up, but have you any I, um, thoughts about which employers might be a fertile field for getting going, um, such as the tech sector or? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, people have tried, you know, uh, JP Morgan, Amazon, um, trying to think who else was with them. Berkshire. Berkshire uh, tried to all get together and they were going to, they hired some people and they were going to try to impact it. You know, you take companies like that and uh, they spend a bunch of money and then they quit. But um, you think of people like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, some of the large companies, uh, if you could begin to start to say, this is how we're going to act um, as very, very large employers, and then they begin to put political pressure on, I think it has to be people like that. Some of the very largest employers, you know, you can start to think about who those are, along with somebody like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce or, you know, the Business Roundtable or something like that that's going to say, enough already. We need to create, um, you know, a great um, agreement amongst uh, employers that this needs to change and be very noisy about it. That hasn't ha really happened at this point. Yeah. You uh, mentioned that this change has to happen first with the employer. How is it people, somebody like you or your company that goes and introduces this model to the employer, how does things get started? I can think of changing the topic to 401k plan, okay? It was introduced to the companies with the government encouraging them to do it. Who has to educate the companies to do it? Yeah, in the case of, you know, it was J.P. Morgan, Berkshire Halfway, um, and Amazon, they just got, the CEOs got together and said, this is ridiculous, we're going to change some things. And so they tried, and other people have tried. I do think it's uh, large uh, companies that can actually begin to rally a voice around a change. And then again, just somebody that's got a great political movement like the U.S. Chamber or the a Business Roundtable or groups like that, they're able to come aside and say, we're going to get all our members to agree with this and begin to put political pressure on people to change the model. Because again, again, when you look at everything up there, would you bet the model's going to change? I wouldn't bet. Wouldn't bet you a beer that that model's going to change just because there's just no political will right now to do it. Uh, good evening. I, I'm one of those underpaid primary care physicians. <laughs> there's a cardiologist here, so, for, so I was. Yeah, well, take some money from the cardiologist for Sorry. 38 years, yeah. and I'll be taking donations. At the <laughs> um, but I have a couple comments about uh, funny things in medicine after 38 years. If I see a diabetic patient in my office with hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity, arthritis, all this, and I treat them for a half hour, I get X amount from Medicare. If I clean their ears, I get one and a half times that amount, and, and a, a well-trained chimpanzee could do that. Yeah. So it just seems funny that, you know, for thinking, right. you don't get paid, but for doing, you do. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. And then just another comment about healthcare. You know, it's on the individual. If you want to live to be 100, you don't smoke. You don't gain weight. You take cholesterol pills. You exercise. You, you get married and stay married, okay. <laughs> which is also increasing life. You know, you do all these things that are well known to improve right. your life. Yep. Yet, we drive by a casino, it's packed. And you talk about people who can't get insurance. Who are these people yeah. in a casino that, where is this money coming from? They yep. should be saving for retirement and their health care in the future. Yep. 100%. Yeah. It's, uh, longevity is a big topic now in the country. And yet when you read it, it's all don't smoke, eat well, get exercise, have socialization. It's like, 
Well, that's kind of basic. I mean, it's, but those are the things, the keys to long life and to all the things that you were saying. Yeah. And again, when you get into behaviors, uh, it's there, people have a lot of responsibility. I think one of the slides said 2% of America actually have healthy lifestyles. So there's, we had a lot of, lot of room to go. I, I came from Hastings, and Hastings, Barry County is part of a Blue Zones initiative. So it, it is a, part, there is an initiative there. So with all of this and what you're proclaiming we need to do, is there really a pathway that we all can get behind to support? Or is, do we have to wait for the Amazons and the other big companies to forge the way? Because it really is going to have to be a, a community impact model to make a new path and make it successful. What, what, is, what is the path? Yeah, no, I think it's, um, I think it's people um, articulating their voice um, to legislators. I do think, I, and again, I shouldn't say it's just only large companies, but companies begin to start to look together to how we're going to change um, the model. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of, uh, of you know, uh, making your voice heard to people that this has to change. But for those that are retired, yeah. <laughs> we're not part of that. Yeah. Well, and again, you know, um, the ARP is a very political organization. I don't know, you know how effective they are. But I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, that, and that, I think that's one of the frustrations that people have is how do we begin to have our voice uh, heard? And yet, you know, uh, what's interesting about politicians, um, if you go to a politician's offices, um, they have regular days where people come. So they know that, well, this group's coming today, this group's coming tomorrow. They're really a waste of time because they just listen to people all day long. But you know this idea of trying to get some momentum around it. I wish I had a better answer for you, but but we need to get people rallied around it. And it maybe starts with the blue zones. It maybe starts with employers. All those things that we need to change. Uh, so I'm a cardiologist, which he was talking about. <laughs> and we're going to get part of your salary uh, to yeah. the primary care doctor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Go for it. Um, uh, I can say I think acute care medicine is really great in the hospital, uh, but that's we've got protocols for that. What I want on the outpatient is like 100 of him because outpatient medicine is terrible. There is no good treatment for chronic illnesses. There's not enough access. It's obvious we need so many more healthcare professionals and extenders getting in patients' faces, telling them to lose weight, talking about the diet. It really has effect when you do that. It doesn't have an effect when you see them every six months. That's a nonsense. But when you see somebody regularly and you develop a relationship with that person, it doesn't have to be a well-trained, expensive you know, specialist. It needs to be the family physician and his nurse practitioners and their system, and it will work. I've heard of countries that have done this. Paul yeah, Farmer yeah. talked about it in Haiti. You know, they can treat multiple drug-resistant TB better than we can because they have a system of people working, you know, with the, with the natives and with the inhabitants. I, I would like to say, I'd like to see the companies you're talking about take um, responsibility for reorganizing outpatient medicine, and that would make all the difference, I think, in our country. Yep. 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 We had a company um, in Ohio that um, uh, owns Corning. They, they hired their own primary care physician, set up their own dietitians, and set up their own programs for their own employees. You know, so actually said we're gonna we're gonna provide our own primary care. They um, they reduce their healthcare costs fairly dramatically. Right? Yeah. Yeah. The other thing about uh, nursing, uh, the number of students uh, turned away from nursing is massive in this country. They, they don't have enough teachers, they don't have enough infrastructure. And it's so sad because, again, just from a nursing standpoint, we could do so much better. Sure yeah. And there are some professions, I'm not going to start naming them, but, uh, they actually work to keep the numbers low so they drive salaries up. Um, I've got a question on uh, one of the areas where we have the highest number of suicides and we need general practitioners to address is the VA hospitals. Where does the VA fall into all this? Well, you know, the VA has uh, been, had a lot of pressure the last decade or so, especially for, for their level of care and some of the problems that we've seen in the VA system. Uh, they're kind of an island unto themselves. Uh, they really are. You know, when you begin to think about kind of mainstream health care, uh, the VA is, um, you know, I think about, uh, healthcare conferences and things. The VA is their own, their own beast, their own animal. They, they kind of do their own thing. So how they play in this and how we improve the VA system, um, you know, becomes very, very political. 
probably the same sort of things that we've been talking about need to happen in the VA system as well. And it has a lot to do with um, staffing, uh, expectations, salaries of physicians. I know uh, what you're talking about relative to low salaries. So probably a complete overhaul of the VA system. In your opinion, will you see universal health care in your lifetime? You know, um, um, well, my dad lived to be 95, so I have a few years to go. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I, I got to believe at some point when you begin to look at all these numbers that are going to just keep getting worse. Um, and it's hard to wrap your head around, you know, the suicide rates and infant mortality and all these other things. And, and then the fact that people don't have care, uh, have care and all this medical debt, we have to do something. And so, you know, it becomes very, very political very quickly. Um, and people like to argue that out. But I think just, um, again, we look at every other country that's done it, we have to figure out a way to do it. There's a cost to it. We may have to stop doing some other things, but that seems pretty basic in life that you provide coverage for people. Yeah. Yeah. So we did a social experiment during our uh, COVID where we uh, gave extra money for child, for uh, food aid for, chi for, child, for children. And uh, you know, we cut child poverty by uh, half. And yeah. uh, you know what they did? They, they stopped it because yeah. they, didn't want, they didn't have the willpower. So we need to put pressure on our politicians to do the changes that work. We know some stuff that works. Yep. That's one of them. And yep. then uh, we've got uh, the hospitals are, are, are fighting against good practices that help for good outcomes. They reduce the number of, uh, of nurses per patient in really high stress care, yep. and uh, you know, maybe we have to put maybe we have to put some policies in that way. Uh, yep. they, the the, the uh, supposed nonprofits that are making millions, and we've got uh, millionaire uh, administrators that aren't real doctors. Right. And in the healthcare world, uh, there are um, a lot of organizations that have tremendous amount of money. You know, and uh, some of them that have you know, three, four hundred days cash on hand. You know, they could, they could run four hundred days without making any money because they have so much cash. But then you have a lot that don't. So um, there's a lot of scrutiny right now in nonprofit hospitals and the profits they're making and uh, CO compensation and all those sort of things, which is good. I mean, so you see some of them are, um, some of these healthcare companies, CEOs are making, you know, 10, 20 million dollars, which makes no sense, again, when you begin to look at all these other things. So I think we're going to actually start to see more legislation around capping salaries as well. Go to any metropolitan area, I know you know all this, the largest employers are overwhelmingly the hospital systems. 100%. Yeah. What are those systems doing and what should they be doing to drive the change you're suggesting? Yeah, you know, um, so um, what, what many of them would say is, well, I can't do it alone. I can't go out and change the model by myself because I'm going to get punished for it. But you're right. So this is where it gets a little bit, um, uh, we employ so many people in this country in healthcare. It's crazy. I mean, all the things that we talked about, all those different organizations. And you're right. The largest employer in most communities is, is the health system. And you begin to think about that and you think, like, so that has an economic impact on the community if you begin to, to you know, change the job situation uh, in those companies. Um, you know, I think the thing is, I don't think any um, hospital or health system in and of themselves are going to do anything dramatic because it's going to impact their finances. But they may start to do more things of the things that we're talking about, more social determinants, um, you know, um, maybe looking at medical debt. You know, there's statistics about two-thirds of American hospitals suing people over medical debt. I mean, come on, you know. And, and so those sort of things I think practically hospitals can start doing to look at their own um, um, policies and procedures to not sue people for medical debt, helping people socially, providing more charity care. That's, that's part of the tax-exempt issue in this country where people are getting in trouble that they're not providing enough charity care. So I think those are all the things that's very minimal practical steps that hospitals can do right today. I've read in several magazines, 81% of all of our tax dollars go for social programs and the military. Okay, now some of these countries that probably provide free health care have two old World War II prop planes <laughs> as their defense because we have 6,000 bases around the world and we protect all these people. The uh, average income of retirees now 
for retirement that they've saved is either 186 or 168 thousand dollars. Now, how far is that going to go? Right. No, exactly. Actually, the numbers that I've seen average sa savings for Americans is more like 40 to 60 thousand. I think it's somewhere in there. And you begin to look at again the rising costs and healthcare costs are projected to go up five percent a year for probably the next 20 years. So that's why you know when we begin to think about making change. Um, it's, it's a tough issue. It's complex, as we talked about tonight, but appreciate you uh, giving me a few minutes to talk with you tonight and just uh, sharing Great. a few things. So thank you very much.